Well, you know, we do this. We, we tell our borrowers to do the same thing on single family fix and flips. It's, a, it's one thing to hand them a list of what you're going to do. It's another thing for them to walk through, uh, t talk about the materials they're using, the vision for what this place is going to look like when it's finished. Because, you know, it, it's hard to it's hard to see when there are walls there. Uh, mm -hmm. It's hard for them to, you know, kind of picture it while they're sure. doing it. So yeah. that helps. Yeah. Um, let, let me talk about your investors, if, if you don't mind. So uh, you, you're, you're buy and hold. Uh, so you're going to refinance and you're going to repeat uh, essentially. So w when you bring investors into your fund, are you keeping them in there or as the values have become stabilized and you refinance, are you buying them out or it just depends on each uh, uh, property that you're doing? Yep. Good question. Um, so first every building that I buy is its own fund. Right. right. I, I raise on a per deal basis. I don't have like a general open ended fund and you come sure. and go or you have a little priest of everything. It's just, do you like one, two, three Main Street? No. Then how about four, five, six Oak Street? You know, like let's let's take a look at different opportunities, different deals, because um, there's different appetites for you know different investors. Some of them like new construction. Other ones want cash flowing assets from day one. Although there was others like short term rentals. Right. And um, mm -hmm. and, and some want to be involved in all of them. So uh, each deal is, is its own fund. And when we raise money on a deal, my typical structure for either a new construction or a value add is over the next 36 months, I'm going to force appreciation by the sweat equity that, that the operating team is going to be putting in, right? We're mm -hmm. increasing the income. We're decreasing the expenses. we got better management in place. We're going to turn over the tenant base. We're going to bump up all the rents, renovate all the units, reduce the utility expenses, appeal the property taxes, all that stuff. And because we can create, kind of like I showed an example earlier, so much appreciation in such a short amount of time, again, we're able to be into a $10 million building for $7 million. And if I can go get a 70 or 75% LTV loan in that, in that area, then that allows me to then get all my money and all my investor money back off the table. So I can pay off the short-term acquisition loan. I can pay back all of my investors. And the way that I pay my investors, I give them a they like to see, I, I've realized there's typically two types of investments. One's either like a fixed debt type of a return where it's predictable sure. cash flow, but there's no equity upside or no equity downside. And then the other one is that equity, right? There's big upside, but there could also be big risk and there's not the stability of cash flow. So we've kind of created a hybrid of paying a dividend while the money's invested. Once all the investors get their money back, then we also just, then they maintain their equity in perpetuity. So they might maintain, you know, I might, I might carve up a somewhere between 20 to 40% of all the equity in a deal, just give it to the investors and they hold on to that forever, even after their money um, comes off the table. So that allows them to have predictable cash flow on their money while it's invested. And then once they get it back, they can go and reinvest it into something else and have predictable cash flow. But then this first deal is still kicking off cash flows, right? It's still kicking off uh, the rental cash flows, even though. Uh, the preferred return isn't isn't being paid on that deal any longer. But yeah, they they maintain uh, their equity, so they get depreciation, they sure. get the principal pay down and appreciation, uh, they get all that stuff. But I've seen, and, and mine's kind of probably somewhere in the middle. I've seen uh, some people who just pay a fixed debt uh, for people investing in their in their multifamily. They pay six percent as you go, and they pay another six percent when they get refinanced, and then the investors have no more equity ever in the deal, and the operator mm -hmm. keeps a hundred percent of the equity. And then I've seen the other side of the spectrum, which is more of a traditional syndication where the investors have 70, 80% of the equity in a given deal. Um, and the operator only has a, a small portion. And maybe there's like a waterfall where once the investors get their money back, maybe it's 50-50 split or, or whatever that looks like. But um, it, and, and that's probably good for a more, more stabilized asset. If you're going to go buy something that's cash flowing from day one, that's a good route to take. Um, but if you're putting a lot of sweat equity into the property, you're creating that appreciation as the general operating partner. Uh, I, th I, I think you're, you know, uh, there's a lot of value that you're creating and, and you need to be compensated with a little bit more equity. Um, and, and you got to be, you know, aware of some of the traditional syndications because I've seen a lot of fees get taken off the table by operating partners and, G right. and GPs um, yep. where it's really not like, you know, I, I, I like our model because really, the GPs and the LPs were in the same boat, rowing in the same direction. I Your get interests paid. are aligned. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I get paid when they get their money back, right? I, yeah. I've only taken an acquisition fee on maybe 40% of the deals I've done, maybe 50%, I don't know, somewhere in the half range. 
Um, and I don't take acquisition or um, asset management fees or fundraising fees or capital events fees or disposition fees or anything like that. Um, we just do, hey, maybe there's a small acquisition fee to keep the lights on at our, at, with our company and keep the payroll paid. And then when the property performs, that's when I start getting paid as well. So, uh, you know, I, I like that. I think the investors like that. But it, it, it all depends on the deal and depends on the operator. Yeah, sure. And as you know, some investors, sometimes they just need the money. Uh, even though they wanted that equity piece, um, you know, things change over three years. For sure. Uh, so sometimes I was going to say that it, yeah. if it's one where you've refinanced and you're giving them their uh, equity piece uh, in a bonus cash, let's say, and you're refinancing it, that cash is not taxable because it's not a sales event. Uh, it was a cash out refinance event. Mm -hmm. yep. And so that still saves them on, on taxes as well. Uh, Big time. And then the depreciation offsets all the other cash flows, you know? Sure. Exactly. Okay. It's just knowing your investor. I mean, when you, you said the six and six model, the six pref with the, with the six uh, kicker at the end, that's going to fit more of a, like a, like a self-directed IRA person because sure. depreciation means nothing to an IRA. Yep. Whereas, you know, cash depreciation means a lot more. <laughs> Fair so it's just so. knowing your investor and which which avenue you want to take. I was going to yep, say that uh, self-directed uh, retirement account currently. Yeah, as long as there's no changes. Yeah. 